Hello, everybody. Uh, we'll get started in just about one minute. All right. Uh, well, thanks everybody for attending. Uh, speaking of Oaks, and good afternoon or good morning or good evening, wherever you are. Um, we are delighted that you're here. Um, you, you've met me before. I'm Jim Bradeen. I am the director of Oak Global, uh, which is headquartered at the University of Minnesota. Um, speaking of Oaks is a partnership between Oak Global and the Oak Newsletter. And we have with us uh, Charlene White, who is the uh, curator of the Oat newsletter. Um, I also want to take a moment to introduce uh, Annie Harview. Annie, are you with us? Hi there. And Annie just joined the, the, the uh, Stakeman Borlaug Center and, and Oat Global um, as our communications person. We're delighted that you're here, Annie. So we're, we're hoping that our, our webinars um, flow smoothly and we appreciate your, your efforts here. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. And um, before we uh, get started today, just a, a few housekeeping um, uh, issues. We, we are, of course, recording today's session, and it will be made available on our YouTube channel um, at a later time. And um, throughout this webinar, you're welcome to submit questions using the Q&A widget that's at the very bottom of your screen. Um, please use the Q&A for questions. If you've got more general comments, you can drop them in, in the chat. But the Q&A um, comments are, are actually preserved as, as part of our recording. So we appreciate your attention to that. Um, Charlene, am I forgetting anything before we get started? I think that's everything for now. Great. All right, well, it's, it's my uh, distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Um, we're going to hear from Alan Raddy, who is a national oat breeder with Intergrain in, in Australia. So uh, good morning to you, Alan. And um, Alan's gonna talk about their, their breeding efforts. And I will turn it over to you. Uh, you are muted. There you go. Okay. Um, has that come up on the screen okay? That looks perfect. Uh, we're not in presenter mode yet, so perfect. Okay. Um, morning, afternoon, uh, evening. Thanks all for your uh, for your time and, and attention. Um, really looking forward to, to talking about oats. Um, those of you in this, anyone joining from Australia, I think most people know that I'm generally a little bit enthusiastic, uh, do have a tendency to talk. So I, I will be paying attention to the clock and um, if someone thinks I'm talking too much, please let me know. Um, so everyone would remember um, uh, the, the previous breeding program led by uh, Pamela's were from Saudi in Australia. Uh, that program was uh, tended out uh, by the funding agencies uh, about 18 months ago, that process started uh, through an expression of interest, uh, Intergrain. We are a commercial breeding company and uh, we were successful in the tender. So, uh, so that's why there's been the transition from, uh, from Saudi and, and led by Pamela to um, Intergrain and led by myself. So I'll just talk through a little bit about who Intergrain are. So we, we are, a, um, we are a, 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 we run like a private company, but our shareholder actually is, uh, there's two shareholders and they're both government. So one of them is the GRDC, who I think um, quite a few of the people on, on online would know what the GRDC are. Um, and, um, and they're funded by grower levies and the other organization that um which is the major shareholder of intergrain is actually uh deeper or department of primary industries and rural development which is a mouthful of course um in western australia uh, so our head headquarters are in perth and if you can see my little screen which is kind of in around or in around there um one of the one of the beautiful things about perth when and hopefully many people get out to the ioc conference in october are the beaches of perth and, and i must confess i moved from canberra just kind of inland um, to Perth, 
um, to, to take up um, a different role in, in, um, in Intergrain four years ago, but a but transition to oats and, and I love the beach. So um, Andy was talking about it snowing uh, before I, I would have been, if I was in Perth right now, I'd probably have been just coming back from my ocean swim. But um, so Intergrain is a company. Uh, so we, we, now, um, we now breed wheat, we breed barley, we now breed oats. So we actually have the dominant position in Australia for, for barley. So we're about 60% market share. And in wheat, we're um, we're twenty odd percent and, and increasing. Um, obviously, in, in notes, we have zero a market share, but we hope to to change that. So uh, a yield plot for us is sort of like about a four meter long plot by a meter and a meter a bit wide. Uh, we have about three hundred and twenty thousand of them in, across Australia now, and you can see the the map there of, of where our yield plots are. Some of them, uh, some of them like the side up here, for example, in in northern WA, Carnarvon, um, up near Exmouth, which is where Pamela went uh, watching wild sharks last year. Um, sorry, the IOC conference will be a little bit uh, late for that, but it's still a beautiful spot if you want to uh, combine a holiday with the IOC conference. And yes, I am plugging the conference. Um, the, it's, um, that was a disease nursery we had up there, but we, we actually, as you can see, we have the yield plots all across Australia in the major growing regions of, of, the, of what's traditionally called the wheat belt, but it's very, very quickly turning into a multi-crop multi, a multi um, farming system. Um, so we, we obviously, um, uh, in, the, in this process with, uh, with so many yield plots, we have quite a lot of staff and um, we have uh, three major locations being Perth over here um, and then uh, Horsham uh, down, in, down in Victoria, down here somewhere. And then we have a couple of local, local offices in New South Wales. One of our major things is we, we have a very collaborative approach to breeding. Uh, we, we love to work with, um, with uh, public um, entities and, and other private entities where it makes sense. And we definitely love two and three-way links. So a little bit about myself. So I actually did my PhD in sugarcane in North Queensland, uh, Townsville, Cairns. And anyone who um, comes over for the IOC conference, if you want to book another holiday, go to Cairns. It's beautiful up there. Go to the reef, best in the world. Um, and um, But then I, I moved from uh, sugarcane into, I worked for CSRO in, in um, trait pre-breeding. Uh, and, and then I moved uh, back into real breeding in about 2011, 10 years ago. So I... I joined Dow AgroScience to, to be a wheat breeder. Um, and, I, and I love being a, a, a breeder that uh, goes from end to end of the, of the program. Um, so I was also, the, when I joined Integrate in 2018, I was the, uh, the lead um, breeder on the project that, that we had with um, AVR around uh, genomic, uh, genomics that I'll touch on in a tick. And, um, and I'm always um, open uh, to email discussion and, and phone calls if you're in the right time zone. And one thing that was really crucial to our success in, in note breeding was we actually, um, we engaged Pamela from, she finished with Sadi one day, she started with Intergrain the next day to, to onboard me in you know, note breeding. So um, our overall business strategy when it comes to, to, to breeding, um, regardless of the crop is really, we need to optimize the genetic gain per dollar we invest. And so we have a few pillars that we work through, you know, genomics, phenomics, we have a lot of research, as I said, and, and we're always continuing to, to try and improve our breeding excellence through uh, doing more for less, um, but also we, we've got to make sure what the, we understand the correlations and negative trade-offs in that process. So I'll just talk through a little bit about what we've done in, in wheat and barley as an example as to, as to how we, we, um, we like to, to view research and how we like to have impact. Um, and so, uh, so this is the applied genomics that we went through, and, and this was um, presented by um, by our scientists there with um, that we work with and partner with at, at AVR. Um, there was actually a, a, a very good presentation on this and there's a publication that's come out. And so we were, we were trying to work through how we were going to apply genomics and all the different platforms, all the different ways that genomics was being done in, in wheat and barley and, and deployed into a breeding program. So there's, there's lots of data. So our aim was, was quite simple. We wanted to, to, to cut through all of that and actually build a custom design and build a tool that was going to work for us in the in the real world in plant breeding. And so, so what we did was we engaged um, AVR, so Matt Hayden, Herman Spangenberg, uh, his lab, and we walked, worked through a process. We chose a, a Lumina uh, to, to build the chip, uh, and there's a, there's a many reasons why, and I won't really go into, into detail in that, but, you know, when we're genotyping at F3, F4, F5, something like that, you always have HETs, and so... You know, we needed to make sure that we could, we could have something that was um, able to call hats. And we also wanted to be able to do something that we could do both wheat and barley on the same chip, obviously, it's all around cost. 
um, yeah, at some point, but understanding the, the correlations between. Um, so, so we went through a very, a very rigorous process. Uh, this was a four year project with many million dollars of budget that we went through. And the, in the end, we designed a um, custom designed and, and contracted a Lumina to build uh, a customized uh, chip that had 40,000 markers on it uh, that we tagged directly. But the key, one of the key parts was, I'll get to the next slide. Oh, I can that's a little bit further through. One of, the, one of the key parts we had to do was make sure that we, uh, we covered the diversity. So um, the linkage that we, we had enabled us to say, okay, in wheat, there's a, there is, a, as everyone knows, there's a lot of genetic diversity. So we had 6,700 global accessions that we'd done on the old 90K SNP chip. Uh, we then uh, selected out of that a subset of about 1,200 that we said uh, maximally covered the diversity. So you can see here on the little PC, PCA plot, you know, we made sure that the all the red dots were the ones that we we did ex uh, that we did some um, skim sequencing on. Uh, then, then we went through and we also did some exome capture on a on a bigger set. Uh, that, that as you can see, that that total is about the twelve hundred that I mentioned. So some of this was uh, privately funded. Uh, this set here was privately funded through a different partnership that we were able to link into and leverage. Uh, this here is publicly funded, and then obviously this set here, the hundred hundred odd, is uh, integrated selected lines. That we funded directly to for exome capture. So there was a uh, quite a lot of genomic data. The bioinformatics team who did this, um, there's no way I could do it. Uh, they're an amazing team. Uh, their uh, their computer um, room, if you want to call it that, you know, their the central hub where they have you know 50 uh, 50 computers all plugged in um, is is quite impressive. And when you walk in there, when it's actually going, it is it is warm. So it's the the computers are working hard. So we so we we made sure that we we captured the genetic diversity that there was in in wheat, and we made sure that we had good coverage in that. We then repeated that in barley, um, and again you can see here there was quite a lot of uh, public assets that were available, which was fantastic. Obviously, barley is a diploid. Um, in when I was a wheat breeder, we used to refer to barley as Arabidopsis. Um, the barley breeders never found it funny, but all the wheat breeders did. Um, and um, but obviously a diploid does make life a lot easier, and so whole genome sequencing. Uh, costs are a lot lower and you can see that we actually ended up going for whole gen genome sequencing in what we funded. A lot of the other stuff was GPS or, or exome um, or skim, uh, but we went straight in for the whole, whole, whole genome sequencing because at that point, barley, I think we're talking, I think it's about a, know, like a thousand, 1200 US dollars a line to, to do a whole genome sequence, whereas for wheat, it was about the same price for exome. So we just went straight in. Um, and again, we made sure that we covered the diversity as you can see here in, in the PCA plot. So the, the next phase, obviously, is SNP discovery. Um, and we went through a very exhaustive process there in both wheat and barley. And the, the end game out of all of this was to have a, a, a very robust chip that we could uh, customize and design um, and with maximal uh, coverage. And as you can see, you can see there all of the, all the pretty little box plots that everyone loves around uh, how good a job we did doing coverage. I won't go into detail there. Um, but what we wanted to do was have a then build the, uh, imputation potential. So we wanted to use the, the big reference sets, so the exome, the whole genome sequence, uh, to come back to what we tag directly. So, uh, so when I say tag directly, as in we, we the 40,000 markers, that, that's what we're tagging directly. But we wanted to understand the linkage using LD between those markers that we tag directly compared to, uh, compared to other correlated SNPs, which are in LD. So um, we developed, uh, the scientists there developed a, a picking mechanism, if you want to call it that, uh, an algorithm to try and work through the, and, and bootstrapped it, of course, to try and work out the, the optimal maximum number of SNPs that we could impute from the minimum number of SNPs we tagged. So obviously it's all around uh, at that point, there's a balance between cost reagents uh, versus uh, how many versus information you're getting and then concordance of that information. And so. Yeah, there's just a little example there where we, we know that um, by taking one SNP directly, we're actually we're actually able to impute to four others with a, a greater than 95% concordance, uh, which in breeding sense, in selection, sorry, is pretty good. Um, definitely good enough in, in breeding. It's a little bit different. So we actually do, when we want to, when we want to use something as a parent, we do genotype a little bit deeper, uh, but when we're just doing straight genomic selection, uh, you know, a concordance of 95% is more than, more than sufficient. So that's what we run with. How did we? Uh, sorry. Then the next thing is um, where what we ended up. How that ends up. How that ends up looking once you actually do that. 
So you can see there on the left, um, in the end, we have about 20,000 wheat uh, snips that we tag directly. And if we go um, out of the circles, you can see that you know, we tag 20,000 20, directly. If we take a 90% concordance, we actually can tag 400,000. If we, if we take a 70% concordance, it's, it's 600. 50%, it's 760,000. In the end, we've actually, um, we're, we're continuously optimizing and redefining the calling algorithms um, for this. And we're actually now a little bit over, I think it's about 1.2, 1.3 million SNPs we're able to predict and impute, sorry, at, a, at about a 70% concordance, but we haven't actually published that yet. Um, and you can see there on the on the right, uh, the barley numbers are, are smaller simply because it's a diploid. And, uh, but again, you can see the, the power that we have. So, so basically, the, um, the chip that we'd, we've developed uh, becomes the workhorse that we then use for, uh, for genomic selection. And, then, and, we, and we also have been very keen to make sure that, uh, that this tool is available to the public. So we've actually struck a deal with Illumina um, and AVR where the, the, this, this chip is actually available to anyone. And, and um, uh, we have spoken to people at USDA, sorry, complete mental blank forgotten, forgotten his name, um, uh, USDA. So USDA, for example, have actually purchased a couple of thousand of these chips and they pay the same price as we do, by the way, uh, so that we can um, make sure that the, the tool becomes available to the globe. Uh, the, the end game being that, you know, the more pre-breeding from a, from a business viewpoint, what we say is the more pre-breeding that's done on the same genomic platform as us, then the, the information becomes translatable immediately. But what we all are also painfully aware of is, aware of is that the, um, the cost to, to the public entity in particular for if they want to run, let's just say 500 uh, lines through a, through a SNP chip is quite expensive. Whereas in grain, we're running 30, 40, 50,000 through a year. So our buying power means that price is good. So, so we actually, we're, we're setting up partnerships that way where we're able to pass on the savings that we have. Um, how did we end up doing? Um, so this is a subset of the, the data that we've actually uh, gone through in the, in the initial design phase when we were um, setting up the, the final calls, uh, the final SNP, sorry, to tag directly on the, in the chip before we built it with Illumina. And um, you can see there that uh, for looking at, um, at single, at um, uh, if we, the, the concordance between the, the single hybe and the dual hybe, so single hybe being where we put through, we used the, the XT chip, we put through just wheat or just barley. And then when we dual hybridize, you can see that we're, we're running at around about 99 and a bit percent concordance. So in other words, uh, for, for barley and, and wheat, we're um, sort of in that you know, 95, 97%. So you can see that we're, we're not losing, the loss of information for going dual hybe um, is not significant, but obviously that means we're halving the cost. So there's a, obviously an increased cost to reagents as you put through um, uh, DNA extraction, et cetera, for, for wheat plus barley, but the actual fixed cost of the, of the chip doesn't change whether you're putting on a one crop or two. So it's a, it's a massive saving for us. We're now at a situation where it costs us less to genotype than it does to grow a single yield plot. So stage nought, for example, um, in wheat and barley, we're, we're, we're talking about 35,000 lines that we used to put into a yield plot at one environment. Um, so a yield plot, again, being that four square metres, four or five square metres, it's now cheaper for us to run genomics and discard before we, before we go to yield. So, and there's, and there's the publication um, that, that I spoke about. So that, that tool is available. And um, if, anyone wants, if anyone wants to, you know, I, I understand that uh, quite often in, in our world that uh, people are also working in other crops, other cereals, especially barley. If anyone wants information, please uh, give, me a, give me a hoi and um, I'll, I'll pass on the details to the appropriate person. Um, so that's, that's really one example of, of, of how Intergrain have, have effectively collaborated with the, with the public entity. And, and, um, and I'll, I'll just go through a little bit now as to how we're deploying and making changes to, to breeding um, as a result of the transition from uh, public to private breeding. So if everyone's familiar with the good old breeders equation, that's pretty much what, um, with the resources and the team that uh, was available to Sadi and Pamela, that's pretty much what they were able to do. You know, they, um, selection intensity was, was somewhat fixed by the amount of resources they had. Uh, their, uh, their accuracy um, was, imp was improved by METs, but again, limited to how many sites they could go to. Uh, their genetic variants, again, limited by their resources and their, um, and their time, or the, you know, they were predominantly working in winter, cycle, winter cycles only. So, 
at Intergrain, everyone knows genomic selection. I won't talk about that, but we're, we're developing an Intergrain um, a selection platform, genomic selection platform. Um, we're, we, uh, we're heavily utilizing phenomics uh, to try and improve the phenotypic depth of our data sets. Um, and so we actually have um, a fleet of about 10 drones. We, we do partner with Purdue University for feature extraction. Um, so we can turn pretty pictures into data. Uh, pretty pictures are nice, but in the end, until you turn that into numbers, it, they're a bit meaningless. But so we've uh, got a good working relationship there with Purdue um, for, sorry, I've actually, again, forgotten what the, what the program's called, um, progeny. And, um, and so we actually use that to, to do our feature extraction. And we're now into, into working through how we extract multispectral data and, and Canterbury temperature data. Um, uh, this is just a, a basic example of the, of the wavelengths that we can capture and what we do um, with those, uh, how we do that. The, the bottom left-hand corner there, the thermal image is something that we're now uh, able to do more precisely. So we've got uh, three levels of precision, uh, depending on the drone that we have. Um, the last one that we bought is the Zen Muse 2 uh, that we got out last year. We actually, obviously we had to import it, import it from the US. We actually got a question from the US Army as to why um, a little breeding company like Integrate needed such a piece of high tech piece of equipment, um, and, but it works a treat. Um, it's, it does need a, we have a, a, a hexacopter uh, that we need to, to fly that because it's quite a big piece of kit. Um, but uh, the hexacopter can carry a, a half a carton of beer for those who are interested at the field day will probably run it around. Um, and that's just a picture of one of our little drones. So it really just comes back to, to more data at a cost effective price. Everyone knows phenomics, everyone knows that you know, it's non-destructive so that you can go out and you can collect data on the same plot time after time after time. And um, in, the, in, in Australia, we also have oats for grain and we have oats for hay. And obviously in the hay part of the program, I'm gonna, that's, this is gonna have a massive impact. But, but everyone knows that biomass accumulation and rate of, rate of biomass accumulation and then rate of change of biomass is also gonna be important for grain yield. Um, and from work that I was doing in CSRO 10 years ago, I also know that um, water soluble carbohydrates or WSC um, is, is quite important to help fill grain at the end. So if you have a terminal drought, which we always do in Australia, uh, the ability to remobilize sugars in the stem uh, to, to translate, uh, to fill the grain so that um, you've, you've got a nice big flat, fat plump grain is important. And we believe that uh, we'll be able to use this uh, fancy, very fancy piece of equipment here on the right uh, to, to understand the wavelengths required to pr actually predict um, you know, good versus average versus bad WSC. And then once we do that, we'll just translate that into a We'll custom build a, a drone, a multi-spec drone that we can put up with, you know, six wavelengths, for example, that we can extract WC data. Um, I spoke before about uh, the program and, and the resources that we, we were able to um, access. So, so 2017, 18, 19, 20 were, was when the program was being led by Sadi. Just ignore 2020 because that was a blip as the transition was happening. But you can see 2017, 18, 19. Uh, Pemela and her team were averaging about 14, 15,000 year plots. Um, last year, we went from that to 27,000. Um, it's, it's a great, um, it was a fantastic effort by the entire team of Intergrain, but also SARDI, GRDC and AgriFutures, who were the funding organisations, because we actually started, uh, we started this process um, in December of 2020, but it wasn't until about April of 2021 before the, the contracts were signed. We actually had trials planted before the contracts were signed because there was just enough trust and faith that everyone involved that we were able to transfer seed around and start the process. Um, uh, so that, you know, that's just scale again, talking about the breeders of equation. I don't expect anyone to read everything on this slide apart from the fact that in Australia with the, the heterogeneity of, of soil types and the diverse environments we have, uh, we need to employ really, really high level biometrics and, um, and our team here in Australia uh, quite revolutionary in how we do it. So we do you know, sparse mets, for example. So partial replicate is old hat. So for us, uh, partial replication is where you're going in with, you know, like a stage one trial. It's kind of like a mad design, if you want to call it that. But rather than putting, uh, rather than putting the the checks on a systematic grid, we actually randomise them through. We also use the pedigree of the genotypes to uh, to assign them within locations and across locations. So a sparse mat is where you've actually got. Uh, for example, connected pedigrees 
where you'll have, let's say, 10 sister lines, you put them across 10, 10 sites. But, uh, but what you do is you actually spread them across 20 sites in the end. So you've actually got a greater diversity of environments. As everyone knows, where you have G by E, um, you know, the more environments you can sample, the, the better your estimate is going to be across all of that. Um, I've got a, just a couple of little quick slides that I'll, uh, videos that I'll go through. I will mute it because it doesn't quite work. Um, machinery of plant breeding, and this is possible because of the scale of Intergrain. So we have a robot seed packer here, as you can see, um, it just goes through and, and does what it does. So it goes at about, for one person, three to 350 plots an hour, uh, whereas um, a normal eight hour day for, a, for one person by hand is about 350, 400. So it's, a, you know, it's, an, it's an eightfold increase as to how quick we can pack trials. I go into these cartridges that you can see here, and that links through to the through to the next thing, which is um, which is uh, how we plant. Um, and um, so you can see here on the on the planter, you know, they, they basically load up those cartridges onto the machine. Everything's um, GPS driven, uh, so the, the tractor driver is actually just sitting there. He's not doing anything. It's just driving. Uh, the tractor's driving itself. Uh, auto trip so that. Uh, you know the all the plots line up nicely. So this site that I that I had here, for example, um, there was about six thousand plots at this site. And in the end, when you looked at the the gaps between plots, they all lined up within probably a couple percent of each other, which is great. So that all of this just enables us to have a bigger program um, for for less cost. Um, we've also we're trying to extend phenomics. Um, I spoke a little bit about this machine here. We also have a project, this picture here, you can see we also have a project where we're trying to count spikes. Uh, weak tick, we can do that. We can count how many spikes are up per square metre with a, a level of precision that I'm happy enough with. Uh, wheats, uh, barley is going to be a little bit difficult on oats. Everyone knows what an oat pinnacle looks like. It's going to be hard, but we're, we're working on it. Um, so in the end, yeah, this is what our, our breeder's equation looks like now. It looks pretty complex, but there's, a, there's just a lot more layers we've added to it due to the scale of intergrain and the connections we have which obviously will improve the rate of genetic gain per time, uh, per dollar, sorry. Um, the other part of Intergrain is we have a very bright and colourful marketing team. Um, someone at some point or other will dress up as, as some of these characters. So this one here, for example, that I'm circling here, the fox, uh, that's, a, that's a weird variety called uh, Vixen that we released. And yes, someone did put on a fox costume at the launch. It wasn't me, luckily, uh, but someone did do that. And um, what that does is it just, it just creates a talking point and people remember it. Uh, but what we are doing now is we're, we're creating a very strong brand. So in Bali, for example, our biggest variety was Spartacus. Um, when we launched the, the Spartacus replacement called Maximus, we just simply went out and said, um, this is the Spartacus replacement. You know, this is Maximus. It's the replacement for Spartacus. And the industry went, yep, tick, moved on. Or everyone grew Maximus. Um, Collaboration is vital uh, to the success of Intergrain. We, we, we work in a, in, a, in a highly competitive environment here in Australia, but, but we also want to make sure that we're collaborating with, we've got the best science. One thing I'll just highlight here, um, uh, this has just come up on our webpage yesterday, the Inari cl uh, collaboration. Um, if anyone's heard of Inari, uh, hopefully everyone has. Um, I can't quite see if anyone's nodding or, or anything, but um, Inari is a um, gene editing uh, company out of, out of Cambridge. Uh, the announcement was that made yesterday Australian time that um, Intergrain and Anari have, have launched uh, gene editing multiplexing in, in wheat. And um, if you want to talk about that, uh, we can do that offline as well because that's that's quite an exciting partnership that we've, we've built there. So, so Intergrain will be launching the first gene edited wheat products within a, a, a four to five year time frame is the plan. Um, what products do we have uh, at the moment? Well, uh, Kingvale, again, through innovation, um, so we have, a, this is an imi tolerant oat and hay variety, so it's not relevant uh, to where you guys are overseas, but, um, but imi chemistry is very important in controlling weeds in Australia. And, um, and so we actually have a, uh, the world's first imi tolerant oat hay that we're bringing out. And again, uh, just, just highlighting uh, partnership and collaborations. Um, massive list of people that I need to acknowledge for, for being able to be here. Um, right now talking about this, and um, I, I won't go through them, but you know the, the one thing that I, I must really highlight is the fantastic efforts by Sadi, Pamela, and her team was uh, was was really quite uh, was really fantastic, and we wouldn't be able to be talking about oats as much now if it wasn't for those guys. So thank you very much. Um, the the conference next, uh, later in the year here in Perth. Uh, just the final plug of that. Uh, so I put up a tweet on, on, on Twitter 
I, sorry, I refer to it as the TWIP, um, a little while ago. Uh, so again, the, the, the tourism things around Perth um, will, be, will be interesting. But this here is where the field day will be at. So this is uh, York. It's a beautiful old town up in the, in the hills behind Perth, uh, Western Australia's oldest inland city. Um, that's one of, that's the town hall. This is uh, this is the paddock where the trial is going to be, just a couple of k's out of town. And um, there's uh, just a few highlights of the town. So look, I really hope that um, as many people as possible can come out. Um, if anyone's concerned about COVID, uh, Western Australia, Perth is probably the safest city in the world uh, for COVID. Um, and the borders are uh, they've just um, announced the reopening of the borders uh, to international tourists and um, and visitors from uh, early March. So hopefully we're all clear that we can um, we can go full steam ahead and have as many people as possible join the conference. We're really excited about it. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you. Um, love to take any questions and, and talk and and especially if anyone's got any um, things they want to talk about with regards to, to building a, a note genomic chip that uh, becomes uh, shared globally. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. That, that, wow, that's that's quite the program, I got to say. Uh, you guys have an awful lot going on there. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, I really hope I get the chance to see some of those quokkas. And actually, the, the one thing about Australian oats that I love is, is the names of the varieties. And there is actually an, an Australian oat called quokka, which I thought was wonderful, um, which I think has bandicoot and echidna in its pedigree. So... Uh, yeah, yeah, I love the names that uh, people come up with there. So, so we've just launched, a, we're launching another one called um, Wallaby. So uh, there's, a, there's a variety called Kangaroo. Um, everyone probably knows what a kangaroo is. And the, now we've got another one coming out called Wallaby. Um, and so, yeah, the, the names are pretty cool. Um, that is for sure. It, um, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. I think in the end, we'll probably, we're starting to run out of marsupial. So we might need to change, a, change the naming convention, but we will follow some sort of a theme as per the, the SARDI uh, system. Yeah, no, that's that's great. And we do have some questions here for you. So the first one is from Wubi Bakella, and he's wondering what the genotyping turnaround time is. On the, uh, the wheat barley XT chip. Uh, that, I'm, assuming he's I'm assuming he's... Well, so we, haven't, we haven't built it yet in, in, um, in Oats yet, uh, Wubin. And uh, I've actually just got an email from Brian Boyle this morning. So, so in, in Oats, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to start to use Rapture as the, as the workhorse to try and build the understanding of diversity. And then we will go through the process of um, um, skim sequencing, deep sequencing, et cetera, to, to build the tool. But in, in wheat and barley, the turnaround time uh, there, Jason Fielder is the USDA guy, sorry, I just remember his name that we've been talking to. Uh, so the, the turnaround time for, for us in Australia, um, uh, we've got it down to about four weeks, uh, but obviously you need to make sure you've got an XC uh, reader available uh, that, that can do the dual hive um, and the, the, the double layer that the XD comes with. So it probably depends more on that than, than anything else. The other part of the equation is uh, that currently all the algorithm callings, the, the calling algorithms, sorry, are based at AVR so that we can improve and refine the, those calls. Um, and, um, and that does add a couple more weeks to it. So we, we're a system now through our partnership where we're sending um, six whole seeds um, that are crushed or rolled uh, for DNA extraction. We've got GBVs back in about six to seven weeks. So that's obviously going through the entire process. Um, for as far as something coming from, from Canada to Australia, I'm not quite sure how long that's all gonna take, but we are talking weeks, not months. Thanks. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Alan, would you um, stop screen share, please? So we can, so we can see you. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. There we Hello. go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Tier Wiesner Hanks says, uh, fantastic talk. Thanks, Alan. Uh, is most of the germplasm you're working with from Australia or have you looked towards other similar climates? Uh, thanks, Taya. Um, so, it's all Australian, but Pamela had done an amazing job of importing diversity and um, everything used to go through uh, the Plant Breeding Institute at Cobbity or in Sydney uh, for, for a rust screen and, the, and then uh, the, the elite material from there would, would get to transfer to Pamela. Um, one thing that will change, and, and I can't see who's on the call, so I'm going to probably going to offend someone. 
One thing that will change is that uh, the funding agencies, GODC and AgriFutures, were reluctant to share too much IP, too much germplasm. Integrating will change that. So we, as soon as we've, as soon as we've got mature that we have 100% um, licensee ownership of, we will we will be able to start sharing that earlier. Um, currently, Pamela had only been able to share the release cultivars um, under the PBR Act. Uh, whereas we will make sure that anything that's at stage two, three, four, wherever you want to pick it from, we can make available. Uh, we really want to just open up uh, germplasm uh, transfer across the world and really work in a system where we understand what's good and what's bad for everybody. So, yeah, um, so there is quite a lot of diversity. We have quite a lot of material kind of that's uh, got North Dakota and Florida uh, lines in the pedigree. Um, the lines that we had in stage two, three, four yield trials between grain and hay last year, about 15% of them actually was uh, one, a single a single cross to an overseas line, mostly for disease. Um, but yeah, we, we definitely do have a, a strong uh, pedigree uh, from, from overseas, mostly North America, but keen to, keen to work in um, European material as well. Mm -hmm. I know there's Canadian material back in there too, because that's where the, the dwarfing gene DW6 came from. <laughs> yeah, yes, for sure, for sure, yeah. Yeah, Australian yeah. oats here, at least the ones I've seen grown are, you know, maybe a foot high. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, we do we do have, um, on occasions, that, that dwarfing gene can be too severe. Uh, so we're actually chasing tall dwarfs, uh, but yeah. Great. Um, actually, I'm going to skip Steve's question just for a second, uh, because wheat guys is related. Uh, are oat cultivars different in Eastern Australia versus the West of Australia? Yep. Um, there is uh, there is a strong G by E. Uh, so if anyone understands a factor analytic model um, in, in the meta-analysis, um, you know, we're at, we run about an FA41 uh, or 3.2. Um, which, which means that there is a fair amount of um, G by E relative to G. Uh, so G by E uh, variants compared to G uh, variants components or, or covariants, if you want to think of those terms. Um, the, the varieties, there's, there's really a couple of dominant, dominant varieties right now in Australia in the grain space, um, being Bannister, um, uh, which, is, which is probably the highest yield, which is the highest yield line across Australia, dominates in Western Australia. As you come east, it's a little bit less um, but there's a there's another variety called Bilby, which is one of the dwarfs based off the SD6, uh, which is uh, starting to get some prevalence uh, going in the east, and it's actually starting to come west. So there are different varieties, yes, um, but uh, at this point, um, you know, the selection program will start to bifurcate even more. We're, we've gone with the resources we have. Um, one of the things I, I didn't quite mention, but, you know, when I talk about the number of plots, uh, there's... Uh, there's obviously a limitation of dollars, but when we co-locate with wheat and barley plots, for example, there's a site in New South Wales that'll be driving past soon where between wheat, barley, oats, we now have 11,000 plots at that site. So they become pretty cheap per plot. Whereas previously with Pamela, when she was trying to grow a trial there at 244 plots, it's pretty expensive. So we're, I'm gonna obviously have a much bigger bang for buck. So we will pull the GBE part further and understand. Right. Thanks. Uh, so Steve Harrison would like to know how many oak crosses and plots per year does Intergrain run? A lot, I um, it. <laughs> yeah, uh, afternoon, Stephen. Um, so this year we had, last year, sorry, we had about 27,000 yield plots. Uh, we made, Sue Hoppo and the team made about 350 crosses, which was an increase on normal, but unfortunately there wasn't, uh, was probably about 30% didn't, either didn't take, cross didn't take, or um, the, the F1 seed didn't germinate. So in the end, in reality, we were at about 250. Um, Intergrain have invested heavily in glass houses. Uh, so we have, you know, the full speed breeding capacity. You know, we, we run our plants at uh, 23 hours a day uh, light um, with a 22, 23 degrees C. So um, we push them all pretty hard and, and that enables us to get through four, four or five generations a year. But that also enables us to make sure that we can have multiple crossing events at any, at any time of the year, basically. So we're crossing right now. Um, so we will increase that number. And then, and then the, the plan will be sort of sort of four to 500 crosses with, in the end, probably about 40,000 new plots. Wow. Yeah, that's quite impressive. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I don't have any more questions or anything in the chat right now. Oh, here we go. Um, 
Okay, so on the XT chip design, uh, 40,000 is quite a good number of markers. Is that chip being used for association or discovery in addition to genomic selection? Or is that high marker density useful for GS accuracy? So the, the, what, we, what we tag directly is what we use for GS. Um, and, and that's usually enough. If you've got a biparental, that's plenty um, for, for discovery. Uh, if, you, if you're trying to go into a, a nested association, a NAM and nested association mapping situation, that's enough too. Um, if you want to do full GWAS, then it's probably enough. Depends on the, on the complexity of the trait that you're working under. Um, if you're working under yield, it's, it's not enough for, for GWAS, but that's where the imputation really drives the, the ability to go forward. So the other part of that then becomes once we, uh, once we use the workhorse to, to identify hotspots or regions, we can actually, you can, you can drill down further in that. There are tools available. So AVR have got a, got a tool called Pretzel. Um, if, you, if you want to Google that, uh, AVR Pretzel, um, what that lets you then do is actually go into a, into a reader sort of landscape where you can say, okay, here's the region of interest. Um, and then scale up to the 10 X, uh, the 10 genome project, for example, and, 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 and drill down further within that region to see if there's anything there that, that you believe is interesting or not from what you know and what other people have said in the literature. So, and then if you need further, you can actually go in and just sequence that region. Um, and I guess the, for us, the, the value of the chip is that, you know, for, if we're in full dual hybrid about $9 a, a, a sample, um, you can run through a lot of diversity and then and then try and fine tune where you do deeper sequencing. Right. Um, you're doing, yeah, there's an awful lot of work, an awful lot of data and all the rest of it, and particularly all these files and so on from the drones and whatever. I mean, how are you managing all that data? <laughs> like um, the progeny software that we uh, that we've uh, worked with out of Purdue does a really good job of, um, of being able to translate pre-pictures into, into numbers. So what we then do is those terabytes of, of images that we get, we very quickly uh, rip them off, get out what we need. Uh, we make a decision based on the, on, the, on the data and the trial, whether we keep the, the terabytes of images or whether we just bin them. Um, I don't like binning anything, but at the moment, you know, when we, the amount of data we've collected. So, so last year alone, I can't remember the, the number, but I think last year alone, I, I collected something in the vicinity of about 50,000 images uh, from, the, from the drone at, at 25, we, we usually fly about 25 metres high so we can get you know, good coverage um, as far as distance goes, size goes. So yeah, there's a lot of images there. Then, and once they're extracted, we then zip them up as best we can, either put them on a hard drive or, or take them offline or, or put them in the, in the bin, but yeah. It's a, it is a, it is an asset. It is an interesting question. Um, and on the genomic side of it, we're actually building a, a, a different database altogether to, to house genomic data. All of the phenotypic data goes into AgroBase, uh, but the, the phenomic data, once it's extracted, goes into AgroBase, but the actual raw data behind that at the moment, we're, we're struggling is probably the easiest way of saying it, but we're, we're trying to work through processes to, to work out what we need to keep and what we don't need to keep and store. Yeah. Because that's very tricky. Uh, I mean, you also mm. have to decide for the storage for your, you know, the seed as well. And <laughs> I know breeders always yeah. have trouble with that. Um, in fact, I think it was Brian Rossnagel who used to say that breeders don't actually select for anything, they select against things, you know, that most of your job is to throw stuff out. <laughs> so yeah, uh, and, and I love that analogy. So so I you actually refer to genomic selection. I usually call it genomic discard. We never select the winner with it. You know, all we're doing is chucking out the crap. Um, and so it really, whoever designed it in the first place, um, and I know, so the, the first publications were by Merzawan and, and Ben Hayes. So Ben Hayes works in that AVR group that we talk about, and, and uh, Mike Goddard was his PhD, uh, PhD supervisor. Again, he works in that, in that AVR lab. Um, and I said to Ben one day, um, it was actually over beers at PAG, I said, why did you call it genomic selection? It really should have been genomic discard. And he just, yep. <laughs> but uh, we had to, apparently had to have selection in the title. So yeah, it's all about chucking out the, the, the garbage as quickly or as efficiently as efficiently you can. Right. Okay, so uh, Paul Richter would like to know, what are your plans for the IMI oats? Um, so at the moment it's restricted to, to hay and that's really just around market acceptance. So um, in Australia, most of our oat grain is exported um, and it's exported to markets where there's um, concerns around MRL issues, so, so residue in the grain. 
And uh, so we really need to understand, uh, is there residue or not? So currently um, the registration for, for King Vale is around uh, single gene any tolerance, uh, IBS only, so integrated before sowing. Oh, hang on, sorry. Sorry, I'm just sorry, being, I'm I'm just, just being a, yeah, sorry. Sorry, <laughs> sorry they're, they're trying sorry. to keep, I'll be, I'll be 10 minutes thinking. Sorry, they're trying to keep getting my tolerance, sorry. Um, um, yeah, so, so integrate before sowing. Uh, and what we've seen is that there's, there's no MRL in the grain, but we just need to, to go through a process and prove that. Uh, so we're thinking, you know, three, four, five years, um, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to register it in grain. So if anyone, does anyone ever know what the immunochemistry is? Um, it, you know, kind of a bit like the difference of the axiom that you guys use over there, but it's a similar sort of process. Okay, and uh, Whoopi would like to know, can you share the price of chip genotyping in wheat and barley? Mm. So the, the, the 40K uh, chip that we have for, for wheat and barley, we're at about, um, we're at about uh, I think it's 18 Australian dollars um, for, for the chip uh, with the markers on it. Now, obviously you need to also add on DNA extraction um, and some reagent costs, but yeah, we're sorry, sorry, DNA extraction. That eighteen dollars includes the reagents. That's what it costs here in Australia, um, in Australian dollars, not US, uh, uh, not US dollars or Canadian dollars. So yeah, it's, it's it's pretty cheap. And that was one of the purposes of what of why we did it. And again, as I, as I said during the, the actual presentation, but the the reason why we want to pass that on at the same price that we pay is because because we're buying so many, we get them. We get a scale of discount basically, and um, from Illumina, and so we just want to pass that on. And Illumina is happy with that as well because it, the more people who use it, the, the greater demand they've got, and it's it's good for their bottom line. Create and it also creates um, certainty for them, decreased risk. Right. Yeah. No. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there are no other questions at the moment, or anything in the chat. Um, yeah, you're doing so many things. <laughs> I think people are a little bit overwhelmed too. Um, I mean, I, I think the the major thing, you know, really for us in Australia is that, um, you, you know, there's a very strong uh, public sector research through CSRO, you know, uh, GSC funded, uh, all the universities, etc. So there's a there's a lot of innovation, and an integrator very keen to to link into that innovation and and foster it and, and build it. And, and, you know, I think Anari is a, a fantastic example of, of that. The, you know, the fact that um, they've uh, they've come out, they've recognised in Australia, you get your value as a plant breeder through the grower selling seed to the mill. Uh, so we have an endpoint royalty system, and I know something very similar is coming in 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 in, uh, in Canada. Um, I can't remember what it's called, but it's it's very similar. So you know, if you think of US corn, US um, soy. It's all based off seed sales. Uh, we don't make any money from seed sales. We don't even try. We, you know, we just want to make sure that as many growers as possible grow our varieties because they're better than what they had. And when they deliver to the mill, uh, that's when we get paid on an important royalty system, um, which for me is a much better value proposition. And, and Nari have actually recognised that when they came to Australia, they actually came for the, the value of EPRs versus seed sales because to, to gene edit a product in the US to get enough value we're back to the gene editing company and the, the breeding company I don't know, thousands of dollars a ton of, of, to, to buy the seed and i don't think anyone's going to do that so yeah so and i guess our, uh, i'm sorry go ahead no, I, was going to, I was just going to say another thing is too varieties in australia would typically last you know three to six years depending on how good they are so, yeah, sort of uh, sort of that half breeding cycle right so it, does that tend to be because of disease or other factors uh, just the rate of genetic gain that we have in our breeding programs. So yeah. Okay, right. So that's that's a good thing. <laughs> so. There's always disease changes, and we always select for that as we go, and then we obviously we we kind of select to breed for it. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's it's really just the the rate of genetic gain we have for for yield and and maintenance or improvement for everything else. So there, I mean, there are, speaking of disease, there are other diseases that you guys have to cope with. I don't think we do. For example, um, I think it's called red leather leaf. Is that correct? Yeah. Red, red leather is really an issue in, um, in Victoria, um, which is where I am right now, which is a small part of the wheat belt, uh, the, the oak belt, um, and a bigger problem in hay because the colours are important to, to the Apparently the, the dairy cattle can, can sense the color of the hay, I can't understand, but anyway. Um, 
but, but um but yeah it's very it's very important in hay it, it does have an impact in grain that is for sure because it obviously reduces photosynthetic capacity um if the leaf's red instead of green um but yeah it, it's um it's a big issue there probably the biggest issue in australia is um septoria um which is a disease that is prevalent elsewhere but the pathotypes we have here are very different um, and yeah, I know that uh, Pamela and the team there at Sali have been working hard in that space. And there is diversity coming, and there is improvements coming from from Pepta, from the the Quaker nursery. Um, but but yeah, we we need to just keep working on that space because it's a it's a very quick evolving pathogen as well. Okay, and and I hear things about uh, like crown rots and so on, but that's not always fusarium or anything, is it? What are those causal organisms for that sort of thing? Is it it's a different fusarium to what you have in in, um, in Canada, um, but um, where oats is grown, it's usually not such an issue. So that's usually a sort of northern New South Wales and Queensland. And again, um, you know, it, it every trait when you have every sorry stress when you have two of them, they're they're not purely additive. Uh, so so crown rot plus um, heat or drought uh, drought stress and one plus one equals three. If you want to think of it that way. And, um, and so that's where those uh, those issues are bigger. Um, in parts of Western Australia and South Australia, there is there is um, fusarium crown rot, uh, graminarum it's called, uh, but uh, they normally have a good enough winter and spring that you don't really see the issue. Um, if you have a tight, what we call a tight finish, so, so a dry spring, yeah, it does show up. But normally it doesn't. Okay. We do have another question from Wubi. Uh, how many wheat barley lines do you genotype every year? Uh, do you genotype all the lines at the same lab? Uh, so last question was, yes, everything gets done at uh, Bundora ABR there um, in Melbourne. Uh, we currently are doing about 30,000 lines a year for wheat and barley. Um, so, uh, so as I said before, so we go from, we send, uh, seed from from perth um it takes about you know, four or five days to get to melbourne uh, once it gets from once it gets to melbourne to through dna extraction genotype uh through the xc reader genotype calling uh gbv creation we're talking six or eight weeks okay. and did i hear right or when you do your dna extractions are you using seed or are you using leaf tissue sort of thing uh, so we actually use seed. Uh, so, so, so basically what that enables us to do is um, we, we harvest a single plant from a segregated population. Uh, we thresh that. We then take off six seeds. We put it through a, a roller. We actually custom built a, a roller that just cracks the seeds so that the enzymes can, can do the dig digestion required. Um, and it goes through, goes through, through from there. So um, because we, the turnaround time is, is what it is, it just works in our system. If we were to do it from leaf tissue, then you've actually got to go out and tag every single plant and blah, blah, blah. So yeah, we could do it within in a season, uh, but it just adds another layer of complexity. What well, by doing it this way, we're able to say that, okay, you know, because the the genotype actually happens contra season anyway, um, that we can we can just do it that way. So yeah. So effectively where what we're going to from what used to go to stage naught um, from stage zero will now effectively become stage one. Okay. So cut a year out of, cut a year out of the program, sooner it came, the dollar goes up. Yeah, because I'm used to using leaf tissue, <laughs> this sort of thing. But uh, yeah, because seed it can be rather difficult to do, but um, we'll have to check out some yeah, just, protocols and so on. <laughs> yeah, just, just, by, um, just by cracking the seed, you know, it enables you to, um, uh, so that the digestion can occur. And John, and John ends on digesting going to be again. We actually built custom built a, a robot to do that for us. Um, so it's affectionately called Yara, which is a race built backwards, and um, and it does about 2,000 a day. Nice, <laughs> so yeah, get people talking to you about that. Um, there are actually a couple of comments in the chat, and I'm looking at the time here. As Steve had said, excellent presentation. Um, Rika's question we already asked. Um, Pamela uh, has a comment. Uh, just wanted to add that Thanks stem rust is important <laughs> in Eastern Australia and crown rust across the country. So in terms of the diseases that uh, you yeah. folks need and, to do. And, and, and crown rust or leaf rust is a really interesting one. Again, it evolves so fast. Uh, and um, there's, a, there's actually a, 
oats gets used for the three different things in Australia, grain, hay, and there's another um, forage oats. And, and usually what happens is, I don't quite, again, I don't quite know who's on line, so if I offend anyone, I apologise. Uh, but lines get imported from North America or, um, in particular, and they come out as a forage oat line, and they say they've got um, resistance to crown rust or, or leaf rust. And, yeah, they might have it in the US, but it doesn't have it over here, and all it does is just add to the, to the load. Um, and a knocking on load and you end up with lines that are going kind to of, go from an MR to a, an MS overnight, basically. So yeah, it's, it's a massive issue and it, because it evolves so fast. Stem rust doesn't actually happen in the real world very often, but we know that when it does happen, it's going to be catastrophic. So we're always uh, breeding and selecting for that. Right, yeah, for sure. Okay, um, we're pretty much out of time. Um, I'd just like to say thanks to everyone. and. If anyone's got any questions they want to talk to, especially in the genomic selection build, I've actually been talking to, to Nicholas Finker a little bit offline about that. I've um, been talking to, to Brian Boyle as well. If anyone's got any suggestions, please let me know. Um, we will, we, we are going to make an, an investment in that space. So we so we want to optimize as much as we can. And and the collaborative nature of oats actually lends itself really nicely to me because I love you know being collaborative and talking and, and partnering with as many people as possible. That makes sense. So yeah. Um, unfortunately, Intergrain is not part of the PANO consortium. It is what it is. Uh, we'd love to work out how to, to be able to work with, with that group um, and go forward together, yeah. Well, we're very happy that you'd like to collaborate with the rest of us because yes, a lot of people I'm certain will be very happy to collaborate with you. Okay, thanks all. That's wonderful. Any final comments or questions from people? Should we announce our next webinar? Sure, absolutely. And Alan, thank you so much for your informative uh, talk. It was really, we appreciate your, your, your time and, and enthusiasm. Very, very impressive. Thank no, thanks all. Great, great to be, great to, um, be here. And fingers and toes crossed as many people as possible come out for the, for the conference. I'd love to walk around. Um, Peter McCormack apparently has organized a special brew of oat beer. Um, me personally, I like barley beer, but anyway, it's what it is. I drink oat beer. I drink oat milk, so why not? I mean, I grew up on a dairy farm and I drink oat milk. What does that mean to the dedication of the course? Um, there you but, go. Uh, but yeah, I really hope that we can we can open a very collaborative um, discussion and meet as many people as possible at the conference. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Share my screen with the next uh, webinar. Yeah, so um, our next um, webinar is scheduled for March 17th at 11 a.m. And we'll hear from Wika Yan, who um, is with the audience today. Um, and uh, we'll hear about oat breeding at AAFC. Uh, we will open, um, we'll open uh, registration very soon. Um, and you do have that link handy? Uh, yes, I do. I'll drop it in the chat. Yeah, so um, we'll, we'll just drop that uh, link in the chat and uh, watch your email in the OAT newsletter for more details. Um, and again, thank you all for, for being here. It's always, it's always a fun time for all of us. Thanks, everybody. And actually, yeah, remember that uh, in March, that's when all the time changes happen. <laughs> so that's why I have the time, the EDT in red there, because depending where you are in the world, forwards, backwards, whatever, the dates and times of the time shifts are, yeah, it varies a lot. So yeah, there's a lot of potential to mess up the, uh, the meeting time, but it's, it'll be 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So UTC minus four next month. So. Perfect. Bye, everyone.